So we have time for some questions. Yes, right at the back first. It seems like everything obviously to do with the ear and hearing is incredibly intricate and small. And I was wondering how, uh, how things are progressing with being able to do any kind of transplants when you're kind of becoming you know, more, more hard at hearing. <laughs> I, I mean, people are thinking along these lines. The, the, the problem with the ear is that it's known that the development of the human ear occurs at between weeks 24 and weeks 26 in utero. And it looks as though there's relatively little turnover of the tissue in the ear after that. And so it may not take too kindly to being tinkered with. Um, Transplant, maybe. I mean, there are ways, of course, in which you can get directly at the nerve. And, of course, the whole industry of cochlear implants, which stimulates the nerve directly and but bypasses um, the hair cells, is one way in which people are thinking about this. The whole issue, I suppose, of even thinking of transplants of, is, is one of accessibility. And as I mentioned right at the very beginning, it's the inaccessibility um, and... Of, of, the, of, the, of the inner ear machinery, which sort of makes it a really difficult target for thinking of even quite crude surgical interventions. The one just in about two rows in. Was there a question over there? Yes. Hi, thanks, thanks for the talk, really lovely. You um, should say who you are, sorry, I missed the uh, first sorry. one. Uh, my name's Tommy Jans, uh, postdoc at UCL. Um, you spoke a, a bit about how the, the hair cells um, transmit information to the brain, and that's you know obvious, but what is the feedback from the brain to the cochlea doing? Is there anything known about that? Fascinating. Yes, well, yes, well people have worried a lot about that. There are, there, are descend, there are descending pathways from the brain, both to the outer hair cells and also the inner hair cells. There have been, a, a, the, in fact, this is one of the ways in which I got into this area because Ian Russell and I ended up talking a lot about what the efferent system was going to be doing on the outer hair cells. And um, it, it's clear that when you activate the descending pathway to the outer hair cells, it turns them off a little bit. In other words, it makes them, uh, it, it reduces the feedback. Not hugely, but sufficiently, but we don't know how much it actually does so under physiological conditions. And the thinking at the moment is that the main function of the efferent system, at least of the outer hair cells, is to make sure that the balance between the, the sensitivity balance between the two ears is about the same. So that when you try and localize where an object is in space, you don't get an abnormally large signal from one side. And maybe this is a dynamic process that's actually going on the whole time. The, 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 the significance of the descending pathways to the inner hair cells is a bit more complicated. And that descending pathway tends to, f the, f the, 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 the efferent system terminates on the afferent boutons of the inner hair cells. In other words, it looks as though it's modifying the flow of traffic coming down the nerve rather than influencing the inner hair cell directly. But it's, it could even be that the, the effect of the efferent is different at one end of the cochlea from the other. We don't really know fully at the moment, but very interesting question. Yes. There's a microphone here, to your right. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Michael, I'm a retired engineer. Uh, somewhere along there, and great, terrific, um, I began to feel that I was hearing the explanation of tinnitus, mm -hmm. where it seemed to me that the positive feedback mechanism, which generates the frequency response, sharp skirts, was overcompensating and that the fact that you could hear tinnitus sometimes in an adult, you could hear emissions of sound, seemed to link to that piece of your lecture. Great guess. I'm sorry to disappoint you that it's probably not quite correct. And the reason for that is that we believe that tinnitus is actually of central origin, and that tinnitus is rather like a kind of phantom noise. I do agree with you that it has all the ingredients for looking at the feedback could in, 
almost be thought of as a generating a tinnitus. But the, there are all sorts of little bits of evidence that, that argue against it. One of the most powerful ones is that, you know, we don't take aspirins anymore for headaches, but when people used to take aspirins for headaches and, and perhaps overdose themselves sometimes, you actually get a tinnitus. One of the surprising things about aspirins is that they turn off the effect of, of the outer hair cells. And so when you turn down the cochlear amplification, the brain endeavours to compensate, we believe, compensate for that by essentially turning up the gain further up the pathway. Um, so it's a bit like the interstation hiss that you get on a radio set. And the other way of talking about tinnitus is it's like a sort of phantom noise. And in fact, you're sitting just in front of somebody who can tell you all about phantom pain because there's been a great discussion about whether there's similarities between tinnitus and, the, and mechanisms which generate the, um, uh, as, as well, neuropathic pain of various sorts. And aspirin is reversible. Well, with aspirin it's reversible. Clearly, when you have a tinnitus, there are some cures maybe. Not, I, I don't even want to use the word cure. I mean, people are actively trying to think about ways of reducing the, the effect of tinnitus. The most effective way seem, so far seems to be to address the question of attention. You get people to pay less attention to it. There is no emission. Uh, no, there is no emission. In very few examples, maybe. Again, the person next door to you will be able to answer that question. That's David Kemp. <laughs> <coughs> That's it in the middle. Can you see? Thank you. Hi, my name is Benjamin Graham. I'm a pharmaceutical scientist. Um, I was wondering about the, you were saying that as people age, they lose the hairs and their, on their outer hair cells. And, but looking at the electron micrographs, they seem to be, the cells themselves were still present. It was just the hairs themselves that were, were dissolving. I was wondering about like, the mechanism and the whys of that. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really... Um, can you induce that sort of damage? Can you induce... Well, you can, you can in, yes, there are, there are, you can certainly induce it experimentally with, with drugs because that tends to kill off the hair cells. It's, you can certainly damage the cells experimentally with noise because, that tends, because the, the machinery is obviously very delicate. Um, there's clearly a sort of carcass of the cell which gets left behind, um, but it is, a, it is a manipulatable sort of sy system in, in, in that sense. Right at the back, can you see the... Uh, hello, uh, Heather Jones, molecular biologist. Uh, could you comment on the effect of possibly nutrition or, let's say, calorie restriction on the um, disappearance or um, apoptosis or injury of these outer hair cells? Gosh. I don't know. I mean, what, what, what happens if you ask jockeys, you know, if they... Um, we starve themselves, what their hearing is like. I, I really don't know. Interesting, very interesting proposition. I have no idea at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> Great, you know, this is, this is an example of a wonderful interdisciplinary question. I hope, I hope you'll follow it through. Yeah, this one here, please. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Jack Golem, a retired pharmacist. I'm actually deaf with um, high pitched deafness myself, which is why I'm here. Um, I'm quite fascinated about the, um, the, um, the theories concerning the, the effects of Preston and how they work. I would like, would like to ask you, have you ever considered the possibility of Faraday's laws of ele electromagnetic motion in the process when you have the thumb, the fourth, first finger and the second finger, and the first finger represents the field, the second finger represents the current, and the thumb represents the motion? And perhaps it's the confluence of that with hydrogen bond because of the high um, uh, concentration of polypeptides that it might be creating a sort of a electronic plasma and therefore generating that movement. There's, there's certainly enough energy in the electric field to be able to do that. Um, the evidence against that 
<coughs> proposal is that if you remove the anions from the cytoplasm, Prestin doesn't work anymore. So it's not just a purely electrical phenomenon. It clearly does depend upon the movement of ions. Um, having said that, there is clearly some... When Prestin changes conformation, there are, there are movements of charge within the protein itself. And a little bit of that may be susceptible to the kind of transmembrane field that you're, that you're talking about. Okay, we're going to leave it at that. And it just remains for me, since uh, Jonathan received his medal and his prize at a dinner last autumn when the other Premier Awards were given, it remains for me to say thank you very much for a wonderful talk, just as good as we expected. And I have to say, there is nobody of my age that doesn't always respond to rock around the clock <laughs> whenever they hear it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.